Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you for your presence here, whether your presence is physical or your presence is online. We welcome you to Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. On this, the 2nd of July, uh, uh, which we, uh, uh, we celebrate and give thanks for the country that we have, the freedoms that we have. Uh, we have a few announcements to go over today. Um, one, I just wanted to say, keep in prayer all of our youth from, um, uh, with all the, we're in the transition of, of the Timber Ridge camp, so our, our children are away or going away. I know the, uh, the youngest group is out there uh, this week, and then we go from the, uh, the youth and then the uh, tweens and the teens, and then after that, the family. So just, just keep all of our kids in prayer that the, the weather's good and, and that they, uh, in their journey and their, in their time there, they find an opportunity to grow closer with our Father. Along those lines, uh, Gianni Tia Tapia is getting baptized today by Pastor Charlie. Um, at 7, 7 p.m., uh, they have a huge baptismal out there. It's called a lake. And uh, uh, so uh, our church is welcome out there to support uh, Gianni uh, in the next step in his journey in his walk with Christ. Uh, secondly, we have some, we're going to go with some church business. We have a number of second readings in votes to be taken. A total of uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can see them in the bulletin. So for each one, we're going to do a second reading and then a vote uh, for our members. Um, so for ready, and then after that, one more announcement. So bear with me as we go through this. We'll start off with our second reading for William Cook, transferring from Elizabethtown Seven Day Advanced Church in Kentucky to the Brownsburg Seven Day Advanced Church. I now raise his name to vote. Um, all in favor of welcoming William Cook into the Brownsburg Church, please say aye. aye. Objection, say nay. And at this moment, I'd like to invite William to stand up so we can identify him and thank him and welcome to Brownsburg Church. <laughs> now we have a, a second reading. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can on pronunciations here, uh, but Kamanzi Nakezi, uh, he is transferring from the uh, Kashawana Seventh-day Adventist Church from Mubara, Uganda. How did I do? I did okay? <laughs> and they are transferring to the Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, at this time, I call this to a vote. Who would, uh, who would uh, like or vote in uh, Kamanzi Nakezi into the Brownsburg Church? Say aye. aye. Opposed? Say nay. It has passed. We welcome. Okay, and we're going to follow that up quickly uh, with a second reading. This one is for Rita uh, Mukankuzi also from the Kashawa Seventh-day Adventist Church from Obera, Uganda. Thank you. All in favor of welcoming uh, Rita Mukanzi Kusi to the Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church, say aye. aye. Oppose, say no. It has passed. Welcome. Uh, now we have three more I'm sorry, four more readings. These are for departures from Brownsburg Church. Um, this is, represents the, uh, the Fossmeyer family who are going to Cicero. But let's go ahead uh, and get going with these. The second reading for Chris Fossmeyer is transferring from Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church to the Cicero Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Indiana. Though it's uh, bitter to see the Fossmeyer family go, uh, we send up well wishes. Uh, and now I put it to a vote. Um, though it's again hard to vote for this, um, all in favor of accepting the transfer of Chris Fossmeyer from Brownsburg to Cicero Church, say aye. aye. Oppose, say nay. To Luana Fossmeyer, transferring from Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Adventist Church to Cicero 
Adventist Church here in Indiana. Um, that is the second reading. We now go to a vote. Uh, those in favor of Luanna Fossmeyer transferring from Brownsburg uh, to Cicero Church say aye. Opposed say nay. Claire Fossmeyer, second reading, transferring from Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church to Cicero Seventh-day Adventist Church. We now put it to a vote. Uh, those accepting Claire Fossmeyer's transfer from Brownsburg to Cicero say aye. Those opposed say nay. And lastly, a second reading for Sarah McKenzie Fossmeyer's transferring from Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church to Cicero Seventh-day Adventist Church. I put it to a vote. Those accepting the transfer of Sarah McKenzie uh, to, from Brownsburg to Cicero uh, say aye. Opposed say nay. Okay. All second readings and votes have passed. Thank you. One more announcement to make. Uh, next Sabbath, uh, July 9th, is Pastor Medina's and Lauren's last Sabbath here at Brownsburg Church as they're moving out to New Hampshire uh, to celebrate and recognize all that they've done for this church. Um, next Sabbath, we are having a fellowship meal. Uh, please plan on attending. You know, if you can bring a dish, please, this will be a celebration. I know we made a announcement um, at the end of Sabbath school, uh, but a reminder for everybody that, uh, and those online, please, you know, if you can at all come and say goodbye to Pastor and Lauren. Uh, we do have uh, some cards out back. Uh, this is by where the envelope, I'm sorry, the bulletins are being handed out on the little pedestal there. There's a card that you can be, uh, that you would please sign. Um, and there's also a white envelope, eight and a half by 11 envelope out there that if you wish to make a love offering to the Medinas, um, you can just simply put it in there. I think uh, also on next Sabbath, there'll be a basket. Uh, so if you want to bring in a card, um, that'll be available as well. <coughs> uh, but this, him, uh, uh, him and his wife not being here today, that today would be the greatest time to uh, get the card signed uh, at some point before you leave today. That's all the, uh, all the other uh, announcements are in the bulletin. Please take a look at it. Uh, now I'd like to welcome, it's always a great pleasure that our youth are engaged. Uh, we uh, welcome uh, Melanie and uh, her friend Ashley, and of course accompanied by uh, Susanna, um, who uh, will help us celebrate today. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Good morning. I'm so glad that we're able to be here together and to be able to worship God with all our heart and to be able to keep in mind the lessons and the teachings that he's taught us throughout the year. Pray that our worship today may be a blessing and an honor to him. Join us to, um, as we sing our first hymn, um, hymn number 348, The Church Has Been. Third and fourth verses. The church has one foundation, tis Jesus Christ our Lord. She is his new creation.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for giving us this opportunity to, to be with you today, for giving us the Sabbath and blessing us with this home of yours that you have opened up to us. Be with each of us here. Open our hearts and our minds to you and let your love and your message permeate throughout this house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, join us in standing while we sing, well, um, while we sing first the hymn 648, I Vowed to Be My Country. I invite you guys to stand. <laughs> As we sing our praise hymn, America the Beautiful, there, I just want to uh, remind everyone of this, this time that we get to have to reflect on what has happened in our history and what it should mean for us as a church. And so I hope you guys have been seeing the theme along the hymns that we've been singing. And, um, and this song, America the Beautiful, is actually a very old hymn, and it actually reminds us, if you see in as you sing along, that we are asking God to bless our country and to watch over us and for our decisions not to be made blindly or for any selfish reasons or pursuings, but for God to guide us um, as we work in this country that he gave us. Yes. <laughs> 
hatred dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam Today's offering is for the local church budget. For those that may not know, the tithe that we give goes to support our pastors, the conference, uh, the conference ministries, and the ministries worldwide. It's the offering of the local church budget that keeps the light on, cool in the summer, and warm in the winter. It also supports the many ministries that are here at Brownsburg Church. For the offering, uh, again, we have a, a offering box at the back of the church as you exit to the left-hand side, um, or they can be given online with information in the bulletin. We now go to the children's story, uh, lovingly being offered by Elder Prevost. Uh, unless somebody is hiding underneath the, uh, the pews, I think, as I said, our, our youngest of children are, are out. Um, so the children's story will be uh, given to those, uh, our children, that are out viewing online.
is all we sing sweet hour of prayer. And while you fill all your prayer cards. I think Elder Prevost and I were thinking alike this morning because he was talking about 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 and I was thinking about that myself and like it says in there, it says about pray without ceasing and I thought, I don't think the Lord expects us to be on our knees 24-7 but I do think he wants us to have an attitude of prayer and he wants us to take that attitude of prayer with us wherever we go, no matter what we do no matter what we say. And I think if we can just remember that, it will not only help us each day of our lives, but it will draw us closer to him every day as well. As far as we can, let us kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we indeed want to thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given to us. We thank you for each day of life, and for the opportunity that we have to be able to serve you. We just pray, Father, that you will guide and direct us every day. Show us your will and your way and help us to follow. Father, we pray especially for those that maybe could not be here today, those that may be ill. We pray that you will place your hands, your healing hands upon them, that you might touch them and heal them and bring them back to health. For those that could not be here for any other reason, Father, I pray that you will be with them. Guide and direct them. Help them to know that you are with them. Be with them, Lord, in any situation that they might happen to have. And guide and direct so they might know you are right beside them. Father, we ask that you be with Debbie today as she brings the message to us. I pray, Father, that you will just touch her heart. Let her give us the words that we need to draw us closer to you as well. You are such an unbelievable, caring, and loving God, and we can never say enough about how much we love you and how much we care for you. I just pray, Father, that you will continue now to be with us, to guide us and direct us in all that we do and say, and may we always be willing to give you the praise and the glory for everything that takes place. And we give you the praise and the glory today for hearing our prayer. In the loving and precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray these things today. And thy will be done. Amen. Our scripture reading for today and for Debbie's sermon will be from Hebrews eleven fourteen to 16. If you guys want to pull out your Bibles and read along with me. Hebrews 11, 14 to 16 is in your bulletin. It reads, People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. And if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have, they would have had opp opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. May God bless the reading of his word.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, I am truly blessed to be here. And it's funny, when, when the pastor asked me about speaking, I thought I'd be better from my, <laughs> from my surgery. Um, I, I really thought I was going to kick this thing. I am now seven weeks out. I'm like, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be able to stand up here. Everything's going to be great. The seat is here just in case. <laughs> I, people have been asking me all along, um, what is your, how are you doing? And I always say the same thing. Um, there's been less pain and less progress than I expected. <laughs> However, I did have my checkup this week, and the doctor assured me that um, I'm doing fine. This is perfectly normal. I guess I just thought I was going to be better than everybody else, and guess what? Nope. <laughs> um, but before I actually get started... I, this is not my sermon. It is and it isn't. Um, it's a sermon that's 20 years in the making and a few weeks in the, ma in the making and less than a week in the making as things have changed throughout here. So the one who is actually in charge, let's bow our heads and invite him to come and be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for always being with us, always taking care of us. Um, in Sabbath school, we talked about you being a shepherd. Now we invite you to be our teacher and our comfort and, and let us hear your words. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, if you look up there, Declaration of Dependence. Nope, that is not a typo. That is deliberately my sermon, my title. Um, that started about 20 years ago. Um, a young friend of mine got baptized. He was actually, okay, technically it was my daughter's friend, but um, everybody I meet is my friend until proven otherwise. Um, but... He got baptized, and it was either July 4th or the Sabbath right close to it, like it is today. Um, and his grandfather had come from another state. His grandfather was a pastor, and he had come there to perform the baptism. And he talked about the reason Mark had chosen that week was because there were two things that were very important to him, his country and his God. And he loved the fact that he was able to combine this like that. And I got to thinking about it later, and I got, my mind went on a tangent, as it does. And I got to thinking about the comparison between the Declaration of Independence of July 4th and baptism which is also a public declaration. And I said, someday, I want to do a sermon about this and bring this out because I think it's really cool. That was 20 years ago. A few weeks ago, I was sitting here thinking about it, and it popped in my head again, um, as it has done a few times over the years. And I thought, you know, I really wish I could do that. I really wish I had asked to actually do the sermon. It's July 2nd. It's really close. I could do this. This was great. I wish I'd thought of that sooner. Within an hour, I got a text message from the pastor saying, hey, we have an opening July 2nd. Are you willing to take it? Sure. Thanks. Answer to prayer. I was so excited. After 20 years, I was going to get to do this sermon that I was that I've been thinking about. And so these vague ideas that have popped in my head over the years um, st 
started coming together, and I started writing this sermon. So, like I said, a few weeks in the making. But less than a week, we'll get to that later. Um, but let's talk a little bit first about the Declaration of Independence, because that's what started our country. We'd already, there had already been colonists here for a couple hundred years. Um, but things had not been going well. The king got in our way, <laughs> and we were not happy. Um, he started passing laws that the colonists didn't like. He started passing taxes that we didn't want to pay and charging us for things that we didn't want to take care of. So the leaders got together, and, oh, that's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> The leaders got together and they wrote him a letter. Said, okay, God, you gotta take, uh, sorry. Okay, King, you gotta take care of things. You've got to stop disbanding our legislatures. You've gotta stop doing all these things to ruin our lives. And nothing happened. It was ignored or he just made it worse. So the colonists said, okay, we're going to step it up a little. So they moved to boycotts and protests, and they threw tea in the harbor, and they refused to buy British products, and they said, we're going to quit sending our stuff over to Britain and letting them make all this money at our expense. And... The king responded, sent a bunch of troops over. And eventually they started fighting. There was a battle. Lexington and Concord was the first shots of the American Revolution. But we weren't America yet. Nobody knows who shot first. Um, I was actually there a few years ago um, on the battlefield. And it was really cool. But we still were just thinking in terms of we're the colonies. We are British subjects. And then we didn't want to be that anymore. So the Continental Congress got together and they appointed a five-man committee, said, we want to be independent. So they appointed a committee to write up a declaration. And as usually happens in a committee, one man did all the work. <laughs> um, so Thomas Jefferson wrote the, the Declaration of Independence. He took it to two other members of the committee, showed it to Ben Franklin, John Adams. They said, no, nah, we need to tweak some things. And on July 2nd, Today is that anniversary. They took it to the Congress and said, this is what we got. And they spent two more days tweaking it, and they adopted it on July 4th. That's why that's the, de the birth of our nation. It wasn't, it wasn't the beginning of the process. It certainly wasn't the end of the process. Um, they didn't even tell anybody else about it for four days. The first pub public reading was not till the 8th. Um, but that was the day that they said, officially, we are no longer part of England. So, how'd that change everything? What changed? Did England say, cool, thanks, goodbye, we'll leave you alone now. Nope. It escalated the war, and it went on for another, don't make me do the math, um, so, till 1783. Um, did any of the other countries say, cool, welcome to um, life as an independent nation, and we'll acknowledge you? France, it took them two years, and we'd been talking to them beforehand, and they're like, quietly, maybe we'll help, maybe we won't. 
But it took him two years to finally acknowledge it, and then a few other countries did. But it was just a declaration. It didn't seem like that much. Also, on a personal level, not everybody was happy about that decision. Not everybody in America wanted to be an American. There were an awful lot of people that still wanted to be British. They still wanted to be part of the colonies. And it tore families apart. And as people died and fought, sometimes families were on the other side. Sometimes those splits were lifelong. But on July 4th, we made that public declaration. In your Christian life, it's the same thing. Very few people have this moment where they go from, to use an extreme example, a drug-addled, homeless person on the streets who is completely, completely, completely lost. And in one moment, everything changes. Some people have that moment. Most people don't. And even if you do, there's still a process. But there is a time in that time when you start out as either a horrible person or a not bad person just didn't see the need for God or a pretty good person thought you kind of had it together with God but hadn't really thought about it made him a part of your life until you want to make that decision and that's what my friend Mark did 20 years ago when he decided to be baptized that's what many of you here have done. And you took that time and made that public declaration of your decision to follow God. So, back to the Declaration of Independence. Um, there's been this controversy is our country founded on Christian principles? Um, were our founding fathers, you know, is that, did that matter to them? So I looked it up. You can find anything on the internet. Um, and I looked, and the founding fathers, a lot of them attended church. Some of them were Anglicans. Some of them were Congregationalists. There were apparently a couple of Catholics. But most of them called themselves deists. That was a thing back then where they believed in God, but they actually, a, a friend of mine now calls himself a deist. He basically describes it as God started the world. He started it spinning. It's up to us to keep it going. Um, their belief, these deists, um, were in rationality and reason. God, but God had his place. And in the Declaration of Independence, they called upon God five times. In the preamble, they talk about the laws of nature and of nature's God. Not a personal God, not their God, but nature's God. Get a little farther and we talk about we are endowed by our creator by certain inalienable rights. God built those rights into us, and we have it. Then, after they go through a long list of things that the king did wrong, um, they bring it home. And they say, as their justification for this, they call upon the supreme judge of the world. God, you can judge whether or not our cause is just, but we know it is. And in their execution of it, they call for the reliance on the uh, on protection of divine providence. 
I thought that was really cool, really interesting, because as I looked at it, never did they call upon him as a personal God, somebody who mattered. But they called upon him as convenient for their practical purposes. And they used him to become a new nation. But he was their tool. And that's a big difference between a declaration of independence and a declaration of dependence that we do with baptism when we say, God, I want you in charge of my life. So our new nation goes along and they've made all these declarations and okay, now we've got to actually figure out what to do with all this. So they wrote a constitution and in spite of the fact that they'd said from the beginning, all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain un unalienable rights, the first thing they did after they wrote the Constitution was said, we need more rights. So they wrote the Bill of Rights. And it turns out that their rights really, they weren't as honest about it as with themselves as they thought. They talked about, Everyone is endowed by these rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But everybody meant everybody like them. And as you study history and you look at the slavery, the Native Americans who were pushed from home to home to home to home, um, and just in the way they treated people, They weren't so sure, it took a long time before they said, okay, well, I guess everybody's equal. Um, and we're still tweaking that today. A hundred years after they wrote the Constitution, after less than a hundred years after they wrote the Constitution, the country nearly, nearly broke over these rights and made a civil war. And there's been talk over the years that something else like that could happen. Haven't seen it, but there are people who still think that maybe our country isn't as united as it should be, and so maybe we'll just break off and make our own. Um, but the point is, through all of that, through all the breakings and the fightings and the, all of it, we've survived. Because we still believe in what some, I heard somebody call once the grand experiment of democracy. In our Christian life, it's the same way. We're born subjects of sin. We try to break out, a lot of us. Um, Satan doesn't let go. We have to declare our separation from him, but it's not the same way because we're not independent. Um, Matthew 6.24 says, no man can serve two masters. Um, there he's talking about money, but there's a bigger picture there because he's talking before, this is Jesus talking. In the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever written. Um, and I can tell you, he's way better than I am. <laughs> um, and part of me wishes that, that I could do that, that I could just speak those beautiful words. Sorry, you're stuck with me. Um, but as he's talking about that, he talks about not laying up treasures for yourselves. A lot of the fight that they had in the beginning with Americans, a lot of the fights we still have are about money and treasures and, and all those things that we think matter. 
Um, and after God talks about no man can serve two ma masters, you can't serve God and money. He goes on, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you'll eat, what you drink, what you wear. God can take care of you. And in verse 33, he lays it out. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. See, it turns out, as individuals, we're not made to be independent. We think we are. But as it turns out, while no man can serve two masters, you also can't serve none. So declare, declare who you want to serve. Make a declaration of dependence on God. I invite you all to do that. Because the minute you do that, you've dissolved the spiritual bands which have connected you to Satan. And I mean immediately. Is there a process in there still? Yes, just like there was with the Declaration of Independence. They're like, yay, we're Americans! Now let's get back to work. In our spiritual life, same thing. Is everything fixed? No. Old habits die hard. Um, when I was in, a senior in high school, I got contacts for the first time. Before that, I was wearing glasses. And unlike these little cheap reading glasses, my actual glasses were really thick and heavy. And they fell down my nose all the time. And I did this all the time, pushing them up. Then I got contacts. I'm not wearing glasses anymore. I cannot tell you how many times I'm doing this. Doink, doink. There's no glasses to push up, but it was a habit. Um, I had a friend who quit smoking. And for months after she quit smoking, every time after dinner, she reached for a purse. There were no longer cigarettes in there. But after dinner, she had a cigarette, so she would still reach for her purse. It was just a habit. Um, those habits take time. Old friends die harder. Some of the people you ha hung out with have, are wanting to drag you back into where you were. Sometimes you have to cut ties, or sometimes you can tweak them and just say, this is who I am now. I don't want to hear those stories anymore. I don't want to go that place anymore. Hardest to die? Old ideas. I still find myself, and I am, I was born a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist, and I can't tell you how many generations before that of other forms of Christianity, um, but I come from a very Christian family. I still come up with things that I, God brings these to them that I've thought all my life and not really thought anything about it and all of a sudden God says really oh <laughs> and at 59 years of age I'm still learning I'm still getting closer to God but there's still a ways to go on the other hand that declaration that that I'm God's child, that's still done. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. It's done. And if you believe in your heart, here's why it's done. If you believe in your heart, your heart changes. I better get real personal here. I can't just talk. I have to tell stories, and usually they're at my own expense. Um, when I was younger, I've, I've mentioned before that I've dealt with depression off and on my entire life. Um, 
it was bad when I was younger. It got to the point where I considered suicide. It got to the point where I attempted suicide more than once. And then one day, something changed. I found out I was pregnant. And I was growing a child in me. From that moment that I knew she was a part of my life, I never considered suicide again. Because I had somebody to live for. I had somebody who mattered and more importantly, who depended on me. My daughter turns 31 at the end of this year. Um, at the end of this month, sorry. Um, she is still, some days, my reason for living. It, she changed me. God does the same thing. It's a partnership that we have with God. From that moment, it starts. Now, God is the managing partner. Don't get me wrong. He's the one in charge. But he works with you. And it starts with that declaration of faith. And that faith continues to build that partnership. Now, here's where, go back to the beginning, and I said part of this sermon this past week. I got this far in the sermon and I was getting ready to work on bringing it home. And that's when I talked about, um, that's when I was going to bring in the text, the, the text that we did. Um, Hebrews eleven fourteen to 16. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I like that verse. And I thought it fit really well in with, as a demonstration, just like the Americans desired a better country. They desired to be their own country. So the same thing, in, this is in the, the faith chapter, and it's been talking about Abraham and Sarah, and they left their country. And I thought that was a really good parallel, but I wasn't sure how to bring it home. And I took a break, and I started checking out the headlines and checking on how life was going. And it was bad. Let me tell you something. Um, the headlines I read, the stories I read were brutal. The politics that have been going on in this country were brutal. Stories were painful. Some of the stories, uh, not just national headlines, but personal stories too. And some of the things I was finding out about were directly affecting people I know and love and care about. Now, I'm not going to get into the politics. That's not my job. Um, how I feel about any given issue doesn't matter. And to be honest, as I'm reading all this stuff and I am literally falling apart, with the emotions that I'm dealing with, the most disturbing article I read, the most disturbing thing I saw wasn't a political article or a news commentary. It was an ad, a commercial ad for a product that a company was selling that affected me more than anything else. But with everything that was going on, I almost threw out my sermon. 
I lost faith in our country. And it shook me. And I'm sitting here going, God, how can I talk to people about faith and patriotism, patriotism and bring this all together and not sound like a hypocrite because I would be. I can't do this. I had planned, you see, they're closing him blank on the, on the thing. I had planned on doing a closing song. Uh, a, a special music. I couldn't sing it. I can't do this, God. What am I going to do? On top of that, um, I was on vacation last weekend. I overdid it. Um, I was working a trade show at, for my company, and I was dealing with a lot of physical pain and feeling very much as if my surgery progress was done. Um, the exercises were getting harder, not easier. And everything was falling apart all at once. And I almost, um, almost called the pastor and said, I can't do it. You're going to have to find somebody else. Sorry, I know it's a week's notice, but I can't do this. But then I looked at that text again, the text that I had chosen. And I'm going to read it again. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. A heavenly country. Huh. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. As I'm reading this, this time, in my angst, sounded almost like a cliche, as I was usually, it, originally thinking about it, this parallel between America and God and then all that tied in. But that last verse, but now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And all of a sudden, something broke in me again, but this time it was in a good way. Because that last line, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And I realized that I'd gotten hung up on whether or not the country is good or bad, whether or not people are good or bad, I got sidetracked. But I was looking at the wrong country. See, this world isn't my home. Don't get me wrong. I love America. I love the fact that I'm American. And I appreciate the freedoms that we have because I know an awful lot of countries don't have them. But this ain't my home. And someday I get to go to that city that God is preparing for me. In the meantime, If I'm living this life of faith that they're talking about in Hebrews 11 and in that other verse where it says believing that he believing in God he's not ashamed of us. God is not ashamed of me. God is not ashamed of us. And 
that was huge for me. Because I felt like I was failing him. I had asked for this time. And I was ready to back out. Here's the thing. We all fail God sometimes. None of us are perfect. Sometimes we get hung up on the guilt and shame of those failures. I learned from a a preacher that I follow on social media that guilt and shame are not the same thing. Guilt is not a bad thing. Guilt is an acknowledgement that we've done something wrong. Guilt can lead to change. When I realize I've done something wrong, I feel guilty, I can go to God, I can ask for forgiveness. If I've done, if I've wronged a person, I can go to them, ask for forgiveness. Shame is different. Shame is internal. Shame is saying, not I did something wrong, but I am something wrong. That's not from God. I say it again, God is not ashamed of us. Even when we fail, he still loves us. He's still pulling for us. And I realized that I'd gotten all upset about this country and forgotten about the heavenly one. I'd forgotten where I was supposed to be, where I'm supposed to be concentrating on. Now, I will say this much about politics in that I believe that there will come a time when this world is not going to get better, but worse. And we are going to have to make some hard choices. And if this past week is any indication, I need to exercise my faith just as surely as I need to keep up with my physical exercises to finish getting better with this knee surgery. Um, So I thought about it, and I came up with a plan. First of all, I'm here. So, and then on Monday, I am going to celebrate 246 years of American history. It's not a perfect country, but it's mine. And I am proud of it. I'm proud that we have stuck together, all of us Americans, through thick and thin. We, We bicker and fight and argue, but in the end, we're all Americans. And so I will put on my little red, white, and blue tank top that I bought just for 4th of July. And I will enjoy hoping my husband will kick out the grill. And I will enjoy TV fireworks that don't scare the dogs. (laughs) And I will enjoy my 4th of July. But more importantly, I start today. I want to dedicate my life to God. And tomorrow, I'm going to do it again. And the next day, I'm going to do it again. Like those soldiers who kept fighting for independence, I intend to keep working on my dependence on God. Will I fail him? Probably. I've done it. Did it again this week, although in the end, he pulled me together, as he always does. I'm still not perfect, but I'm perfectly loved. And guess what? So are you. So it's time for a closing song, and I still can't sing the song that I was going to sing. Um, but I can sing another one, and it's in the hymnal. But I'm going to sing it a cappella because in spite of the fact that we have lovely accompanists here, I can't sing it in the key it's written in. So, um, but if you want to follow along with the words, I'm going to sing the first and the last verses of hymn number 472. It's called A Song of Heaven and Homeland. Um, A lot of you may not be familiar with this. I wasn't until I moved to Rhode Island and... A friend of mine from California who also moved to Rhode Island introduced me to this song. But it's 
a song about that heavenly country. And for a musician like me, this touches my heart in a way that so many things don't, that uh, beyond what most things do. Sometimes I hear strange music like none had heard before come floating softly earthward as through heaven's open door. It seems like angel voices in strains of joy and love that swell the mighty chorus around the throne above. Oh, sweet celestial music heard from a land afar, the song of heaven and homeland through doors God leaves a jar. As I sing the, second, the last verse, if you know it, if you want to join in, you're welcome to, because that heavenly music is for all of us. Sorry about the key. <laughs> this music haunts me ever like something heard in dreams. It seems to catch the cadence of heavenly winds and streams. My heart is filled with rapture to think someday to come. I'll sing it with the angels, the song of heaven and home. Oh, sweet celestial music, Heard from a land afar, the song of heaven and homeland. Through doors, God leaves a jar. Bow our heads. God, you always leave that door ajar. And I thank you for that. Whatever is going on in our lives, wherever we are, happy, sad, angry, whatever, you're there and that door is always open. I ask that we keep our door open in return. Come into our hearts. Dwell there, live there until Someday, we get to be with you in person, up close and personal, the way we were meant to be from the beginning. And thank you, God, for loving us no matter what. In Jesus' name. Miss you, Barrow.